Good morning. I'm Philip Lohaus, visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and author of the new book, Power and Complacency, American Survival in an Age of International Competition. I'd like to thank each of our panelists who will be joining us today, who I'll be introducing shortly, for an important for a discussion on how America should devise a way forward for international competition. While the book will serve as a foundation for this discussion, adapting America's approach to competition will require input from a variety of sources, both inside and outside of government. And our panelists are well positioned to provide insight into how the US and foreign actors conceive of competition on the global stage. Just a few words about the flow of the event. After providing a few remarks, I'll turn to the panelists who will each provide a view of the situation from their vantage point. Following that, a moderated conversation will ensue for which we encourage the audience to submit questions to allison.schwartz at aei.org or on social media using the hashtag, hashtag power and complacency. In this conversation, we'll hear from a recent policymaker with experience crafting competitive strategies at the Department of State and three regional experts who are well-versed in foreign strategic predispositions and competitive approaches. Specifically, we'll first hear from the Honorable R. Clark Cooper, former Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs, who's grappled with issues of strategic competition throughout his diplomatic and military career. Also a very good friend of mine for many years. Next, we will hear from Michael Eisenstadt, Con Fellow and Director of Military and Security Studies at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and a keen observer of Iranian strategic culture and a mentor to me over the years as well. Then we will hear from Posse Aronin, a research analyst and Marshall Memorial Fellow for the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and also a research analyst for the Conflict Studies Research Center, CSRC, and an expert on hybrid threats emanating from Russia. And Posse also was very helpful in, in arranging meetings for me in Helsinki as I was conducting interviews for this book. Lastly, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Andrew Scoble, a distinguished fellow at the United States Institute of Peace, whose work has had great influence on a generation of China hands and military analysts, myself included. Before turning it over to the panelists, I'd like to make a few remarks outlining the book's main points. If you'd like to pick up a copy, a link, a link has been added to the event's webpage. Five years ago, I began research for power and complacency after asking myself a question. What explains the gap between the size of America's power and its ability to achieve desired outcomes in foreign policy? At the time, counterterrorism remained the main focus of US foreign policy with efforts underway in Syria and the ongoing conflict in Afghanistan. But new challenges have begun to present themselves. So-called revisionist states no longer seem content to play within the bounds of the rules-based international order. Russia, China, Iran, and others we're finding ways to gain strategic advantage at the expense of the United States. How could the United States minimize this? Well, fast forward to now as we mark the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the withdrawal of America's presence from Afghanistan. Each event compels us to take stock of the lessons that we've learned during the past two decades and where we're going next. In reflecting on the past 20 years, one lesson that I've taken is the cyclicality of international relations. Although counterinsurgency, for example, was thought of as a new concept created in response to novel challenges, it was in fact an employment of contemporary means reconfigured to address a very old problem. Likewise, international competition, hybrid warfare, and the so-called gray zone between war and peace are not altogether new, but rather are novel reconfigurations of old themes that require an adjustment in America's current approach. Just as with counterinsurgency, the United States is finding an imbalance between its power and its effectiveness in international competition. Russia, Iran, China, and others continue to make strategic gains at the expense of a nominally more powerful actor. In arguing the power is meaningless if means are not applied in the right way, the book provides two lenses to examine the problem, strategic predispositions and the balance of power. The first lens, strategic predispositions. In the book, I define this as how a nation competes, goes to war, or pursues its priorities on the international stage. The book finds the United States has grown complacent not only with its way of competing, but also with its understanding of its competitors. The second lens, the balance of power. America has grown accustomed to competing from a point of relative strength by, and by emphasizing its military power. Knowing that they cannot compete directly in military terms alone, America's adversaries have emphasized the development of other elements of power, including diplomacy, information, and economics, and also the employment of military tools in, 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 in novel manners that America, that America is not familiar with, all to America's detriment. America should maintain its military strength as it acts as a hedge on potential direct conflicts and amplifies its influence outside of combat. But it should also attempt to compete as if combat superiority were not a given. 
not only because it may not always be, but because this is how its adversaries think. In the book, I conclude that while the U.S. has set the stage for current dynamics to unfold, it must contend with the fact that their evolution may occur largely outside of America's control. Effective competition in this environment will require institutional alignment. Yes, in the executive branch, but also via funding mechanisms in Congress. It will require flexibility, presidential leadership, a recognition of the key role that information and perceptions play in shaping competitive dynamics, and a long-term outlook focused on exploiting opportunities rather than simply on metrics. The book explores why this will be so difficult for America, but also finds that it already has many of the tools at its disposal to succeed. To sum up, I'd like to pose a few guiding questions that may provoke, guiding question, may provoke conversation. How can America approach competition in a highly distributed, pervasive manner across multiple domains over the long term? How can America accept that setting the terms of competition as it has grown used to doing is not the only way to win? How can America overcome the same complacency that has led to the demise of great powers that preceded it? With that, I'd like to turn the podium over to our first guest speaker. Um, but as a reminder, please submit your questions to Allison Schwartz at AEI.org or use our social media hashtag, hashtag power and complacency to join the conversation. So thank you so much. And um, Honorable Cooper, uh, Mr. Cooper, this the floor is all yours. Philip, thank you. A pleasure to be here today and uh, definitely want to zero in on institutional alignment. Um, like you, a, a fellow analyst, also a historian, I, I appreciate having been also on the implementation side, sometimes frustrating, sometimes successful. But if we look backward uh, as to where we are from that institutional space, you know, since World War II, the United States has helped shape and manage international relations in a, in a bipolar world, as you spell out, and it's maintained that dominant posture in the subsequent post, post Cold War uniform world. Though many assess, and not just uh, some of us, but there are many who are assessing that America's unipolarity is indeed fading. So if we look from Franklin Roosevelt onward, uh, American presidents have understood the tremendous value of security cooperation. Uh, this prompted them uh, all the way through to invest in alliances and partnerships. And these are, after all, significant components of, of our security, of U.S. national security. Uh, and as President Joe Biden himself recently noted, America's alliances are our greatest asset. That is a direct quote from him. Yet, Successful integrated security cooperation, which includes arms transfers, training, security assistance, treaties or agreements, it's all built uh, around two key principles, uh, that of trust and integrity of commitment. And both, uh, which frankly are at risk today, uh, in large part thanks to the haphazard uh, U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and that loss of credibility as well as strategic access in that space. So American service members, uh, many who are, who are dear family and friends and colleagues are based globally around the world. Uh, some of those overseas bases uh, remain in place long since the end of World War II in 1945. Today, the Biden government is amid assessing and determining if military personnel are still required to go so far afield, but such considerations were also made in previous governments. Uh, President Bush similarly made similar assessments, President Obama and even President Trump. Today, with the, the collapse uh, of government in Afghanistan and the degraded posture of U.S. power projection, such an assessment process requires realistic considerations on what the U.S. loses when it contracts or adjusts presence and influence. And as the US conducts a global posture review, uh, the global competitive conditions of today and the risk of complacency by a superpower require the need to not only leverage the capabilities of the US government, but also the commercial marketplace. And this would be a, a means of addressing national security needs. So going back to my last official position, it's, it's why there was such a, an integration of economic security and national security. Um, on these conditions today, though, the first, as noted in Philip's book, is that that refocus of international competition. 
Uh, and in the Trump administration, that was identified as, as great power competition. Uh, and we know, you know, China is is a different potential existential adversary than the old Soviet Union. Uh, and it certainly requires a different collective integrated approach that what then what the West had applied back during the Cold War. And further, China, as well as disruptive states like Russia and Iran, do not have ethical, legal or bureaucratic limits on holistically projecting their power, leveraging their institutions, facilitating proxies, uh, moving asymmetrically or coercing other states. The current American whole of government approach that many are familiar with, if they've served in the military or in the interagency, a dime, uh, and it's actually referenced in the book. Uh, it, it made me smile and chagrin at the same time. Uh, DIME, uh, that, that application of diplomatic, informational, military, and economic realms. However, uh, those generally remain bureaucratically compartmentalized and, and sometimes are, are un unaligned to competitive actions. Uh, they're sometimes duplicative results or in worst case, uh, because they're not aligned, there's an abdication of space. Uh, the, these fiercely guarded authorities, and then of course also the fiercely sought appropriations can contribute to the challenge uh, that I thought Philip aptly identified as, and I'm gonna quote him here, the, the exacerbated bureaucratic silo effect. Uh, it is an effect uh, that I have fought, uh, but at times, uh, admittedly, I, I've probably contributed to that uh, at points in my career. So you know, beyond the National Security Council's convening power, uh, there were some admirable interagency efforts over recent years that I've, I've uh, been a part of that applied a more deliberate whole of government approach toward trans-regional security issues. A uh, good example uh, is state working with defense on what's called the Joint Security Assistance Review Process or the JSAR. And the JSAR is designed to strategically align respective state and defense resources to advance American interests as well as counter disruptions from adversaries. And then at a, a more operational level uh, on the military side, the, the necessity of meeting uh, trans-regional threats of terrorists and, and criminals, um, there was an, a process that engendered successful efforts to overcome uh, barriers uh, of information sharing. Again, bureaucratic barriers, sometimes uh, just protective uh, author authorities, protection barriers. Um, more information sharing uh, that has developed with U.S. interagency, as well as foreign partners, uh, in order to augment either direct actions uh, or law enforcement prosecutions. But still, uh, even though those are anecdotes I'm sharing, and there'll be others that are probably discussed today, some legal parameters and the, the compartmented nature of American foreign policy, national security tools, all of those things, uh, in, in a sense, they impede what could be the maximum capability of American influence. Another condition uh, that I would like to talk about from a, a, an experience standpoint is, is Americans' uh, perception of our, our, our technological dominance. Uh, Frankly, it's at risk of atrophy, uh, or some would say uh, American technological dominance is already in a state of atrophy or complacency. Um, adversaries, partners, allies, uh, they've all begun to achieve parity in some defense capabilities, and in some cases are moving beyond uh, the United States. Uh, while the commercial marketplace is leading in innovation, in, in many areas that are that are relevant to national security, uh, such as artificial intelligence uh, and also unmanned aircraft systems or UAS. The privatization of research and development or R&D has led to a, a kind of a, a, a leveling or technological leveling on the global scale while new threats are emerging. Uh, the technological reinvention of capabilities that already exist and are available to U.S. adversaries is, is frankly a losing strategy, especially where we are now in an era of global and commercial R&D 
that that far outstrip uh, what the U.S. Department of Defense can afford, uh, especially with the current budget trajectory. And then further, the, the loss of U.S. technological dominance and the acknowledged reemergence of international competition, uh, it's, it's also revealed that the current U.S. export control system rooted in the Cold War is not only inadequate with respect to United States closest allies, but it also incurs a risk to U.S. national security and economic security. So again, beyond these conditions and, and well before the fall of Afghanistan, foreign partners were, were already questioning the reliability of the United States at a time when the debate in Washington about our global posture was becoming increasingly politicized. In part, such assessments by our foreign partners could be attributed to their respective budget, um, sovereignty factors, uh, but again, I, I want to note that in Philip's book of power and complaints to see tremendous resources were uh, and are still dedicated in Beijing, in Moscow to question and degrade American presence in the world and cast doubt on foreign aid, cast doubt on security cooperation, cast doubt on anything coming from the United States. And some Foreign information operations are not only designed to discredit the U.S. before the world, but are also directed to American audiences to discredit American institutions such as democracy, civil society, as well as the military and intelligence communities. To holistically counter adversarial disruptions, the case for partnering with the United States needs to be clearly articulated through persistent presence, performance, and a commitment of American security cooperation. Further, deft and robust information operation efforts are required to advance the benefits of partnering with the U.S., as well as educate fellow Americans. The quality of U.S. aerospace and defense equipment, the commitment to build capabilities, and the reassurance that comes from partnering with U.S. military must further include transparency, accountability, and predictability of policies. If not, America's allies and partners will be hesitant to collaborate with us on future shared security requirements, or they will simply seek cooperation elsewhere. We owe it to our fellow Americans as well as to our allies and partners to be candid about the current conditions putting our nation at risk, the cost of maintaining freedoms, and what it really takes to support our shared values of rule of law, civil society, and human rights. As we await the outcome of the Global Posture Review, a completed national security strategy, and even a potential rewrite of the conventional arms transfer policy or cat policy, anti-democratic adversaries in Beijing and Moscow are aggressively exploiting each disruption in America's alliances and partnerships, especially with the recent Taliban takeover in Kabul and the debacle of departure by the United, by the United States. If alliances are indeed as President Biden called, our greatest asset, whether in the Middle East, Indo-Pacific, Africa, or Europe, it is crucial for the United States and U.S. officials to actively affirm their value through clear recommitments and presence in security cooperation, such as recent bilateral pledges made to Israeli Prime Minister Bennett and Ukrainian President Zelensky. It's also crucial for United States officials across the branches of government to actively articulate to fellow Americans the necessity and value of security cooperation and developing security capabilities for foreign partners to protect U.S. interests and mitigate shared threats. On the home front, deliberate efforts are necessary to bolster American citizens' civic responsibility and personal investment and their own freedom and liberty.
the protection of American interests and values cannot be limited to an institutional class or a martial class. That could be a whole other conversation. Um, it will take all the integrated capabilities of the U.S. government and the commercial marketplace to address current competitive global conditions. Washington must be more deliberate in its efforts to take a whole of government integrated approach and prove why choosing the United States as a security partner remains the best option. Today, it is either comfortable old habit complacency or simple naivete to believe sovereign countries around the world have no choice but to partner with the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate those comments and setting the tone, providing a really great overview of the challenges that America faces in approaching competition moving forward. Um, I wanted to tease out one point that you made regarding the achievement of technological parity and how we think of in terms of parity because I think that's a great way to kind of segue to our discussion um, about Iran. Um, because even though Iran has not achieved technological parity in many respects with many of the countries that it competes with, it employs technology in, in ways that um, challenge even nominally superior to countries that have technolog to technology that's nominally superior to that of Iran. Um, so I'm hoping that Mike, you can kind of tease some of that out and also some of these um, larger questions that you and I have discussed um, for years about um, the changing the mindset and about strategic culture and about how, um, how we can get to a better place in terms of our understanding of how to compete against actors that maybe even don't have the same level of technology as we do, but that yet, yet that we still allow in many respects to gain and, um, strategically to our, uh, to our disadvantage. Thanks, Phil. Um, first of all, thank you for being here, uh, for inviting me here. Um, you've asked me to, or asked us to speak about exploitable gaps in America's approach to long-term competition. I'll be focusing on Iran. Um, I would be remiss though, if I didn't start off by saying, I really, um, I've read about two thirds of your book. I've enjoyed it very much. I've learned a lot. And in particular, you've helped me sharpen some of um, some inchoate kind of thoughts I had beforehand, which will sharpen my thinking in the future and improve the quality of my future work. So thank you very much. I really commend your book and it deserves um, a broad audience and I hope it gets it. Thank you. So let me just um, make a few comments based on my um, study of Iran's gray zone modus operandi or strategy. Um, and the first thing I wanna say and I guess I, if, if I wanted to find a bumper sticker, you know, I would go back to the old Pogo comic strip from the 60s, you know, we've, we've met the enemy and he is us. Um, and, and, and the first thing I would say with regard to um, the um, uh, main exploitable gap you know, with regard to the United States and Iran is that the key terrain in gray zone competitions and conflicts is the gray matter between the ears of US policymakers. That is the most important exploitable gap in America's approach to international competition is cognitive and mental in my, in my mind. And I'll give you a few examples. So I think a lot of our policymakers and senior military leaders are trapped using inappropriate vocabulary and mental models derived from America's conventional war fighting experience, which prevents us from um, competing effectively with adversaries such as Iran. So for example, um, we are still focused, I, I think our approach to the use of force is still influenced to some degree by the Weinberger Powell doctrine of decisive force to achieve uh, well-defined goals. And the problem is we are now operating in an environment where it's increasingly difficult to apply uh, decisive force because of the nature of our adversaries and the way they operate and because of our domestic political constraints as well. And because you are forced to op use limited force, you are, at best, you can expect limited results very often. So you're operating in a very ambiguous environment where you, it's very hard to have well-defined long-term policy goals, except you could say we are pursuing incremental advantage against our adversaries enable, in, to enable us to advance our national security interests. Um, now, people often talk about 
achieving enduring advantages vis-a-vis -vis adversaries. And the fact of the matter is in the current environment, you rarely are able to achieve an enduring advantage. It's, it's more or less usually a fleeting advantage. And the competition goes on. So phrases like, tell me how this ends, is kind of, you know, David Petraeus' famous you know, line, don't really work here because it doesn't end. Competition never ends. That's just, that's the default of you know, international politics uh, with human beings. What is our exit strategy? Well, there is no exit strategy. We are, you know, in the Middle East, even in the Middle East where we're drawing down, we're not exiting, although there's a perception that we are, which is another problem related to information activities and America's failures in this area, which is something you, you, you raise in your book. So, um, you know, a lot of, again, the vocabulary and the mental models that we tend to use are inappropriate. Also, I think in the Middle East, at least, we have to increasingly see ourselves as a spoiler and use the techniques that our adversaries used in the past rather than the hegemon. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's very hard for Americans who have gotten used to being the big dog on the block uh, to kind of you know, take up the role of spoiler. Uh, but that's the kind of changes that we're gonna need to you know, make in order to succeed um, in the Middle East. Also, Americans have a binary way of thinking about war and peace and deterrence. Um, and that's the approach you know, that there's war and there's peace War on one hand, peace on the other, and then there's this gray zone in between is rooted in our culture and our legal traditions. And we're not going to change that. Um, but we have to find a way in order to be able to operate effectively in that area in between. Um, likewise, with regard to deterrence, our, our thinking of deterrence is heavily influenced by our experience and our thinking about nuclear deterrence, which is a binary. Either you, you succeeded and there's peace, or God forbid, there's nuclear war. And the fact of the matter is, against our adversaries, we're in a situation, to use General Frank McKenzie's term, of contested deterrence. You never will succeed 100% because there are dramatic asymmetries and motivation between the parties. America's global power with global commitments. We can't respond to every provocation. But many of our adversaries are operating in their front or backyards, and they are fully focused 24-7 on the American threat. And as a result, they have a much higher degree of motivation. And as a result, we're not going to be able to deter everything. So we have to adjust our thinking about deterrence as well. And then finally, you know, there's the excessive reliance on the military instrument, as you point out in your book. Um, and I've you know, kind of written about it as well. Um, and our information activities are still underdeveloped, underfunded, underresourced. For many of our adversaries in the Middle East, at least, the information line of operation is often the decisive line of operation, and they conduct military activities to create psychological um, effects. And so it's the psychological effect which is really the important payoff for them. You look at the way our military approaches information activities, what do we call it now? MISO, military information support activities. In other words, information activities are to support something more important when in fact, maybe it should be the other way around. So again, this is another example where our vocabulary and our mental models, are, I, I think, are, are, are wrong. There's another challenge we have, is that we always see every time there's a you know, potential tensions with Iran, we are totally um, uh, preoccupied with the potential for all-out war, that, that we could, you know, our tensions could lead to escalation and all-out war. The fact of the matter is, and I, and I think we, you know, one should never be cavalier about the potential of miscalculation, but the whole re reason adversaries like Iran employ the gray zone modus operandi is to avoid escalation in war. And I don't think we've kind of under, understood that. And as a result, we've often been self-deterred because of our fear of, of escalation in war. I think we could discuss this more during the Q&A, um, but... I know the president, you know, former President Trump said we were almost at war with Iran. General McKenzie has said this. Um, General Milley has said this. I think the role of an analyst is not to take politicians or senior officials at face value. And there's a, a bunch of reasons why I don't think that's exactly right. We could discuss that to, uh, during Q&A because I want to wrap this up uh, momentarily. Let me just say another problem we face with Iran is that unlike with um, Russia and China, there's not consensus that um, Iran is kind of this implacable adversary. That many people in Washington say, look, we have a number of areas where there are common interests with Iran, for instance, in the fight against ISIS. And some people even say, this is another example where we're constrained in a vocabulary. 
that Iran was an ally with, uh, of ours against ISIS. And the fact of the matter is they weren't an ally. They were a co-belligerent. But again, people lack the vocabulary to kind of you know, find the right way to describe it. And also there's a tendency to say that, look, a lot of the problem with Iran is American policy or our allies. Most of that coup, you know, yada, yada. The fact of the matter is I, I disagree with this, although there, there is, you know, there, you know, um, we've made mistakes, you know, in our in our relationship with Iran um, that sometimes have unnecessarily raised tensions. But the bottom line is um, I, I regard them as, uh, you know, a um, adversary, but there's not a agree, uh, total agreement on on this point in D.C. So this is a problem in terms of creating consensus um, for a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a well thought out long term approach to dealing with Iran. And my final point is Americans, and this is something I just don't understand, Americans don't often see our own role in the world the way that many of our allies and adversaries do. We don't realize how important we often are for regional balances of power. So, for instance, you know, we pulled out of Iraq in 2011 and ISIS eventually rose to fill the the, 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 the um, vacuum. Um, President Obama, you know, reneged on his red line, uh, you know, threats that he made in 2012, in 2013. And within a few months, in the second half of 2013, you had, um, or, or early 2014, you had North Korea ramping up their missile tests, Russia acting in Ukraine, and China starting to build the islands in the, in the, in the in China Sea. So, um, and now we're out of Afghanistan. Um, so we don't realize that we're, the international order is this big Jenga tower and we're the block at the, you know, often in the bottom. And we don't realize that when we pull that block out, it has potentially traumatic impacts on our adversaries. And now Americans, and I'll wrap up here by saying Americans, many Americans are talking about getting out of the Middle East, trying to create a regional security architecture that could play the role to ensure stability in the Middle East without an American role. And they often use the example of the CSCE, OSCE. Well, the CSC and OSCE were able to work because there was NATO and there was a nuclear deterrent and a conventional deterrent behind it. And plus also the relationship between the US and the Soviet Union had become less fraught um, by that time, by the mid seventies. So those conditions don't exist in the Middle East. So again, um, a lot of loose talk and an inability to understand the role that we play in the world as the you know, keeper of the regional order. And the Iranians encourage us, I say, you can leave because we'll work out, we'll work things out with our, with you know your your allies. We'll create a regional security um, architecture um, to enable to keep the peace without America there. And it's not going it, to, it just won't work. So anyhow, those are my comments. I look forward to hearing the comments by the other speakers and the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comments. And uh, I think the point that you were making about regional security cooperation and the framework that exists uh, with respect to some of the other adversaries that doesn't exist in the Middle East is a great way to segue into our discussion about Russia. And um, Pasi, I know that you've had a lot of experience working um, in, on inter-allied approaches to combating Russia, but this point that Michael brings up as well about this lack of a vocabulary, I think is also apt with respect to Russia, right? Um, now, even though terms like Maskarovka and Provokatsia are terms that maybe now have wide, um, Wide, have, have wide shrift here in the United States. They certainly didn't at the time that we started working on this project, not outside of our little policy circles, but um, these types of tactics and techniques, along with others, reflexive control, et cetera, um, these are ways of thinking about competition that really are not um, well understood, or if they are understood, are certainly not um, turned back around and um, countered effectively here in the United States. So. A um, bunch of different thoughts there, but very much looking forward to hearing about um, how Russia is approaching this and how um, the United States can work together better with its allies to counter some of what Russia is doing. Thank you so much, Philip, for having me here. And also, like, I couldn't agree more with uh, my preceding speakers, how they have been presenting things, for example, about us having wrong mental models or like... Uh, or like uh, us being kind of like uh, not necessarily understanding our our own position in this international and global order, and um, I in particular liked like the the idea that uh, now we have new fancy fancy words such as like uh, Maskarovka and Desinformatia and um, Provokatsia that have like made their return into our Western vocab it's because we are kind of like like you presented well in your book, Philip, that we are kind of like rediscovering what we already 
learned back in a in a kind of like uh, during the the Cold War days. So, for example, you were making a great reference into this uh, into books that were published uh, back in the eighties when we were kind of maybe having the peak understanding of Soviet Union as a competitor. But um, I think that there's still kind of like a long way for us to go and kind of like relearn those past learnings. And I'm very happy that we still have like Cold War warriors among us who are still able to kind of like share their their uh, experiences fighting, fighting, for example, the Soviets back in the day. Um, and kind of like the choice of word fighting here was a... Uh, um, like I did that on purpose because I think that like to start we need to understand that we are already in conflict we are in conf conflict with uh, with um, our like these totalitarian adversaries that we are we are facing at the time and by saying we I'm referring not only to the US but the this kind of like liberal countries the new west for example that some people have used that kind of a word so we are as a kind of like in this conflict as an as a larger group of uh, countries who are uh, fighting for like the future future of this uh, international order like whether it will be the liberal one or whether it will be like more bleak authoritarian one um, that 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 seems to be now very threatening at the moment so our binary approach to questions of war and peace it does not really really work in this time so whether we use term uh, competition or actually we we kind of like come to a conclusion that we are actually in conflict because for example in europe we have seen ammunition depots being being exploding we've seen for example people being poisoned and assassinated so those i would say that those are not any more like uh, like examples of like peace reigning over our our territory but but actually like a foreign adversary being being conducting hostile acts on our soil uh, secondly i think that there was lots lots in the book this being discussed about like western relationship uh, for with soviet union and then later with russia and uh, there i think that uh, once again we come back into these mental model models and also like whether we project our our values and our approaches of things to foreign systems such as like russia in this case and whether we assume that they operate based on the same ideas ideologies as we do and unfortunately often because we do this self-projection on foreign systems we end up kind of like uh, end up like having wrongful uh, conclusions and then we end up policies with these numerous resets that we have for example been trying to do with russia i think that we need to be pretty blunt and uh, clear-eyed in in defining what kind of adversary we are having anyway it's a system which is like uh, according to to many authors and many researchers like wholly corrupt it's run by by like Zilovikis and Czechist like security service, like um, both current and former members who are like battle hardened people who are like completely having different values set from from ours. So that should also be reflected in our policy, and uh, thus thus our policy like should be talking from more from the power position and uh, not projecting our values, but understanding that the adversary is not playing with the same rules of the game. And I think this was very well exemplified, for example, on a chapter covering Russia, where there was discussed about like how, what, what kind of, what kind of like uh, institutions, what kind of events have impacted the current strategic disposition in, in Russia. While acknowledging all this, we should also be careful that we don't go into the rabbit hole and somehow think Russia in terms of Soviet Union, because Russia definitely nowadays Russia is not Soviet Union, even though it's it's kind of like maybe slowly turning towards like Brezhnev times, so like uh, Soviet Union or resemblance of that, because it seems like like it's been led almost by a geriatric ward, if if I may use this. But at the same time, they are like much smaller in their population. 
they have much less geographic reach, especially towards the center of Europe. Their population structure is uh, is skewed. They they are having like they are suffering from major brain drain, and also their economy is non diversified, but very heavily heavily like reliant on exports of um, of oil and gas. So so we we should not kind of like kid ourselves thinking that this is Russia is kind of like uh, the superpower of the Soviet Union in, in its kind of like heydays of, of maybe late 70s. But it's actually rather stagnant and, uh, and uh, like much smaller, but still it's aggressive. So we have to be, we have to be handling them correctly. Um, also, when we are thinking of Russia and especially their near neighborhood, so there has been lots of speeches, such as like Putin's latest, uh, latest like state of the state of the Federation speech that that he gave, that he, where he drew these red lines that should not be crossed without defining them clearly. Of course, leaving this this kind of like strategic ambiguity, and uh, we should not allow them to define, for example, what is the faith of, of, of co co countries such as Ukraine and Georgia that are bordering Russia. So, so it's not kind of like Russia is not having any veto for their future, but they are, they should be, these, are, these countries and their, their citizenry should be able to decide for themselves. And as, as, it's, as it seems at the moment, their decision is clear. They want to be integrated in the West and they want to be, want to be part, of, part of like uh, the future, the, the liberal world order. So in that sense, we definitely, we need to support that process like very heavily and be willing to stand with them and and support them in facing facing these hostile acts that they that are happening for example on their soil all the time in ukraine um, i think that um like looking from more practical perspective like looking at for example the disinformation operations that that russia has been conducting and and by this disinformation they have also kind of like supported this, like created this image of them as this superpower that we should not challenge or dare to challenge or there will be some sort of like uh, in our faces situation. So we should better understand the infrastructure that supports their information operations, their manipulation of our information sphere, so to speak. And we should be dismantling that meaning that how they resource their operations how what kind of narratives they are using what kind of tactics what kind of like operational patterns they are having we should expose this and dismantle and at times also disrupt so that kind of like like our environment information environment is not free for all to to penetrate of course this does not mean that we should anyhow prevent like our citizenry from like freedom of opinion and freedom of speech but at the same time we need to prevent foreign actors from influencing influencing the the information sphere of ours and of course while like preventing them from uh, misusing this free open internet for example that we are having on the social media so we need to be be able to kind of like give out our message our hopeful future message to these authoritarian Darian countries, so we need to be able to promote how things should be, in our opinion. Um, as I was referring referring to to Ukraine earlier, so I've I've seen in person how does like hybrid warfare look like in eastern Ukraine. So we can see there like some sort of like uh, version of trench warfare from the from the early like last cent century. And uh, this is to, just to say that military force still plays role even at the time of this gray zone conflict or hybrid warfare or like full spectrum influence operations. So all of, despite all of this, so we still need to have like high end capabilities. We need to have below, like in addition to like special operations forces or like intelligence community and their, their like um, branches of special operations. We need to have robust military force that we can face the, 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 the adversaries that we are having. But of course, this all has been kind of like uh, 
going going outside from our own system but as as it has been already raised by previous speakers we need to have also our own house in order but what i mean by this is that uh, of course there is like uh, depolarization in our societies and of, of course like it's, it has been ex exemplified by the by some of the previous elections in the us so we need to somehow be able to return the sense of trust among among our among our uh, like citizenry and also among different parts of the government so i i would argue based on finnish experiences that a uh, whole of government approach is not enough in this this age and era but it needs to be whole of society which would mean that in addition to including like uh, different like uh, part, parts of government we need to also include include private sector heavily in this um, this uh, conflict that we are having somehow supporting our operations we need to also include ngos and different other like representatives of civil civil society and also our citizenry because the citizenry is the like the power where the power stems from from in our societies and and in order to be able to do this it means that we need to have trust among our citizenry because otherwise this kind of like white cooperation won't be possible and this is also something that we are we are working on in, in in countries like Finland all the time because we we face this kind of like existential threat. So we need to be able to unleash all of our like the all of the the force in our society, and it can't be only done through networks and through this kind of like wide cooperation. And maybe I would like to raise lastly here that uh, of course coming coming from this side of the pond, so. I think that this is not something that the U.S. can solve alone. But I would I would argue that there needs to be, of course, strong commitment from the transatlantic community. But as I was mentioning already, referring to this new West, so we need to include all the all of these different partners that are abiding by this these rules of the liberal world order that was created post World War II. So from the east in japan and south in australia so all of this kind of creates this community of like-minded and that need, we need to rally all that and of course i understand from the u.s taxpayers perspective that is europe kind of like carrying their burden i think that we can do more but in the end we need to do together we can't go alone even even with us us resources it's impossible this this day and age is such and the challenges are so much let me conclude here and uh, waiting for for this um, q a session later on thanks great uh, thank you so much posse and thank you as well for joining us all the way from helsinki um i was really glad that you um, brought up this whole society uh concept because it's something that i think the Finns do very well israelis are another very good example of um, a democracy that has been successful at integrating other parts of civil society into the um, not just the conversation, but the actual defense mechanisms um, when it comes to some of these um, hybrid threats or some of these um, competitive threats that emanate from elsewhere and come inside. Um, so let's go ahead and turn to um, Andrew Scoble, um, who's going to talk a little bit about China. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that some of the prior panelists have brought up is this this um, role that perceptions play. Um, Posse was talking a little bit about how Russia, for example, wants everybody to think that um, it's a superpower, wants everybody to underthink that its power is greater than it is. And I think we see this as well with Iran. And, and I think, you know, with respect to China, there may be a little bit of a different perception there, but the, um, the institutional and uh, mechanisms and cultural and cognitive differences between how China perceives competition and how the U.S. achieves um, uh, competition is something that I think you're uniquely positioned to talk about. So we're very looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the matter. Okay, thank you, Phil, Philip, um, for the opportunity to offer some remarks uh, today about uh, international competition and complacency with particular attention to China. I wanna make uh, three points comparing the US and, and China in the minutes, the few minutes that I have available. Uh, and really I'll pick up on key some of the key themes in your book and reinforce some important points uh, made by my fellow fellow panelists, but perhaps in somewhat approach it, uh, approach these from a slightly different uh, perspective. 
so my, my first point uh, is I think that the, the U.S. needs to become more tolerant of ambiguity in international relations. Americans tend to be very uncomfortable with um, ambiguity, um, whether uh, in contrast uh, to Chinese, I think. In any competition, Americans desire a clear outcome, a winner and a loser. You can see this manifest in, in uh, American sports. The first question uh, American asks when they arrive on the scene of a sporting event in progress is, who's winning? What's the score? And Americans don't like ties. Um, the stats uh, are all about wins and losses. And uh, I think it's the same for wars and geostrategic rivalries. Chinese, by contrast, are more comfortable with ambiguity about not knowing the score precisely. Uh, I'm not suggesting the Chinese aren't competitive. To the contrary, uh, Chinese uh, want to win um, in everything, whether it's in the Olympics, uh, in uh, World Cup soccer, uh, which they've been abysmal, abysmally disappointed, or in global uh, or regional and global uh, geopolitics. Decades ago, China, China had a slogan, friendship first, competition second. I've long joked with Chinese friends that that's been uh, completely reversed. It's competition over everything else. And then when you win, you know, you might shake the loser's hand and smirk. Um, they usually laugh because they know it's true. Uh, but uh, you can overdo these analogies um, and metaphors. And I think there's a danger, the danger in that, but I'm going to um, go, go to the edge. I'm going to push it to the edge and suggest that the, what, what we, uh, called the West Eastern game that we refer to as Go in China, it's Wei Qi. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a game that in, in, is deceptively simple, but it's actually very complicated and it's very difficult uh, to determine who's winning and who's losing while the game is in progress. You know, you've got a grid uh, with uh, stones or, or pieces that are placed and it just, the board gets more and more complex. Um, because uh, unlike in, in Western chess, uh, pieces are not removed over the course of the game. Uh, so I, I just suggest that that is an example or, uh, of how, uh, how Chinese are more comfortable uh, with um, ambiguity and not being, uh, not being so clear about who might be winning and who might be losing during the course of the competition. The second point I'd like to make is that the, I think the U.S. needs to get away from the default, uh, a default uh, defaulting to the U.S. Uh, to the uh, military instrument of national power, and this, of course, uh, is something that others others have emphasized, including and, and is uh, discussed in the book. But we've we've witnessed in recent decades the over militarization of U.S. foreign policy, and to compete effectively uh, in the world today, the U.S. cannot cannot neglect the element, elements of national power, economic, diplomatic, and even technological. Moreover, these levers of power uh, cannot be, should not just be employed robustly, but others have emphasized there needs to be a coordinated um, effort uh, to, to uh, use uh, different instruments of national uh, power collectively not just with, and of course, not just within the U.S., but with our partners and allies. Certainly, that's the way that China approaches statecraft. Beijing thinks holistically, focusing not just on strengthening its armed forces, but also its economy and uh, uh, improving its uh, uh, diplomatic uh, clout around the world. And it's only one measure, and uh, you know, we, we shouldn't draw too much, uh, take too much from it, but if you look at uh, the Lowy Institute's um, count of countries in the world, uh, the number of diplomatic posts that different countries have around the world, China is number one. It's above the U.S. Now, as I said, we shouldn't read too much into that, but it merely, uh, merely underscores, to me at least, 
that the Chinese are paying more attention to diplomacy, sadly, than the United States is. And diplomacy is a lot of things, but it's also about presence. And being, being present and, and active around the world is, is important, um, not just uh, to engage militarily, um, but to engage with our partners and allies, but also to engage uh, uh, diplomatically. So to compete effectively, the US doesn't just need a potent Pentagon, but we also need a dynamic State Department, not to mention an energetic uh, Department of, of Commerce. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is something that uh, the US has, has honestly struggled uh, to compete with. Um, when we try to tell countries that they shouldn't, uh, they should be wary of Chinese bearing gifts, um, if, if you will, uh, then countries often say, well, what's, the, what's our alternative? What are you offering America? And sadly, uh, oftentimes, uh, there really isn't, there really isn't uh, much uh, uh, that the US is, is offering uh, to counter uh, uh, Chinese uh, initiatives. Third point uh, I'd like to make is that the U.S. cannot ignore the element of soft power. About two decades ago, Beijing embraced the concept of soft power. Why? Because the Chinese Communist Party was fearful of U.S. soft power. American political ideas and values, democracy, freedom, human rights, very, uh, they're very powerful and appeal to people around the world, including people in China. The Communist Party of China worries about the potency of these ideas, undermining and eroding its communist dictatorship. So the Communist Party devised a soft power counteroffensive across the board. One highly publicized manifestation was Confu were the Confucius Institutes uh, that uh, were established in countries around the world to promote Chinese culture and language. The first in 2003 was established in South Korea. I should say though that the results, uh, honestly, uh, if, if we're frank, um, and the Chinese, I think most Chinese would grudgingly agree, have been a big disappointment. And it might be, you could go so far as to say they've been a dismal failure. Why? I mean, there's nothing wrong with Chinese culture, Confucianism and, and language. It's interesting. Um, uh, people can get, get excited about it. Uh, but the larger element of Chinese soft power in the contemporary world is, uh, is, doesn't seem to have that much, uh, that doesn't resonate as strongly as American soft power. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, years ago who's in, who's, in, uh, who's in advertising said there's two, two aspects when, when, you're talking, when you're in the advertising business. One is the marketing effort and the other is the product. So uh, my friend told me, you know, you I can sell you anything one time. I can have a very effective marketing campaign. Um, but if the product sucks, <laughs> to use a technical term, then I'm only going to sell it one time. To, to someone's only going to buy one one widget if that widget isn't a good isn't isn't a good product. So I would suggest the reason why Chinese soft power initiatives, uh, and I'm zeroing in. Uh, in Give the example of, of the of Confucius Institutes, why they haven't been very effective is because the Chinese Communist Party is not selling a quality product. By contrast, I think the U.S. is, uh, U.S. soft power is a quality product that has widespread, widespread appeal. So that Americans can feel confident uh, that uh, their soft power is far superior to what the Communist Party of China is pushing. However, the key is that the U.S. has to talk, can't just talk the talk, it has to walk the walk. So we have to live up, in short, to, in other words, we have to live up to these values and ideals on a daily basis. We cannot betray them. This means defending democracy at home, healing the deep divisions, and healing the deep divisions in U.S. society. The U.S. competes best with China by getting our own house in order. So to wrap up, America should be less focused on figuring out who's winning and who's losing in the game of geostrategic competition and concentrate more on rebuilding national unity and repairing democracy at home. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Andrew, uh, for your comments. And um, thank you to all the panelists for all of your comments as well. Um, really interesting conversation. We don't have too much time. Um, I feel like I could, I mean, I'm biased, but I feel like we could talk about this all day uh, between amongst the, the four of us, or the five of us, excuse me. Um, but I did want to ask the panelists one kind of one question, and then we'll turn to one or two from the audience. Um, and feel free for anybody to answer, but this uh, point that um, Andrew was bringing up about the importance of soft power and, um, and that other panelists have brought up about some of the divisions that exist within our society. Um, how does that square? I mean, I talk about this a little bit in the book about like how America is, um, our, our institutions and, and um, as Andrew brought up, our culture, we're predisposed to short-term solutions. Uh, short-term solutions are incentivized in a political sense, right? In a way that um, a country like China or Russia or even or Iran wouldn't really have to deal with as well. In other words, our um, institutions and our uh, predisposition towards strategy um, really lends itself better almost to, well, I don't say lends itself better, but it is, um, leans more towards the short term rather than the long term. So politicians have to think about getting reelected, for example. Um, different agencies have to think about budget cycles. How do we kind of square that? Um, how do we get to this longer term approach where we're more comfortable with ambiguity and with applying soft power um, in a way that's effective? Um, how do we pair that with the institutional and cultural realities that we have to deal with, um, not just in Washington, but in the West in general? And if to pin that on anybody, maybe I'll go to Mr. Cooper, but. <laughs> well, so we, we, have, we have historically applied uh, what, what I termed the, the total package approach uh, when I was in office on not just, I want, to, I want to go back to Andrew's observation about marketing versus the product. Uh, and we, we would make that case uh, very grandly by showing what we not only provided was the best product, uh, but it backed up uh, that if it was material or if it was some kind of training or capability that was being uh, brought forth to a foreign partner or an ally, that it was coming with uh, the guarantee of not just the performance of the product, it was coming with a, a tie, a direct relationship or friendship uh, with us. Uh, and it also came with the transparency and accountability of our systems and protocols here when it, when it entails foreign military sales or direct commercial sales. That said, I do want to go back to observations that everybody in this panel made today, which goes back to being realistic uh, with fellow Americans about the the long-term aspect. I, I, I couldn't help but laugh. It was good I was on mute when Michael referenced Petraeus' book, like, how does this end? He's right, it doesn't end. Uh, and we, we need to be honest with fellow Americans that there is a, there's a persistent need for presence. There's a persistent need to address and deter. We may not be able to be everywhere, uh, but but we are dishonest with ourselves. Uh, and this, this goes back to what Andrew was saying, is that there's there's a discomfort with amb ambiguity because we want some kind of binary clear approach. Uh, but, but for now, uh, we don't have a whole of society. Uh, and, and this is, again, this, we all touched upon the need of a whole of society approach, not just government. And that's why I referenced institutional class and martial class, because uh, look, you don't have to go, but just 20 years ago, and there were comments being made by those families of the institutional martial classes in America of, we went to war in America and went shopping. That's, that, is, that is part of the problem. That is part of the complacency that has been developed out in this, in this discourse today. Uh, but to, to the question of how do we better posture ourselves, it, it does go back to not just the presence and what we're providing our partners, but we have to have an honest understanding amongst fellow Americans as to what those costs are and what the prices are and that it is ambiguous at times and that it's not clear. Phil, if I could just jump in just quickly. Um, we're, we're never gonna have a, you know, <laughs> you know, we're never gonna have perfect unity of effort in the US government because by design, it, it's designed to be, you know, fractious and, and pull in different directions. What, what we could hope for is good enough. And, and, and look, we, you know, with the Soviet Union, we did have a long-term policy of um, containment that was carried, you know, as a multi-generational effort, and it turned out to be successful in the end. But we did have along the way 
we had, you know, the Hungarian revolution of 56 and we had the Czech spring in 68. And, and, and there were times when our response was, um, you know, not in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we had, you know, some, you know, near close calls. So, you know, I, again, I think that the, the point is, is, you know, we have deeply rooted cultural proclivities or strategic uh, predispositions, as you say, that um, we have to fight against, but we're never going to be able to, 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 to manage because, you know, it's not just, you know, the, the inability to do, to do things long term is not just a function of the way our government is structured in the four year election cycle, but it's our entire popular culture. It's, you know, overnight delivery, service while you wait, fast food. And, you, you know, you can't fight against it. You could, you could struggle and, and we should. But keep in mind, there will always be tension. And so it, it never ends, like, like we said. Yeah, thank you for that. And, um, you know, it's true. And I talk about it a little bit in the book, but we have done this before. And we have the tools available to us to compete effectively. Um, you know, we, I talk in the book about NSC 68 and how that outlined a great roadmap uh, for aligning all the different tools in, of government. Um, but this point about um, the, it, you know, and not just being about institutions and not just being about the government itself is, is really well taken. I mean, one of the things that I really found in the book was that it's kind of, it, it's difficult. Presidential leadership was really kind of the one thing that I really kind of came down on as being essential to like communicating to the American public the importance of this, these long-term threats. Without that, and without like, um, without that being supported through other institutions, it's very difficult to communicate to the American public why there's um, a threat that actually requires, you know, sacrifice, for example. And I'm not talking sacrifice like 1% of the military goes to Afghanistan. I'm talking like actual sacrifice, right? That at uh, the level that, um, or involvement, if not sacrifice, at a level that we just haven't seen in this country in a very long time. Um, so I do want to pivot to one quick um, audience question. Um, and, it, you know, this is, um, this isn't really meant to be, I do want to read this one, but I, I hope that the panelists don't, you know, we, we, I don't want to read this in like a partisan way or anything, but I think it's a, an important question. Um, and the audience member asks, what does the US withdrawal from Afghanistan signal to adversaries and how does it impact regional security cooperation, especially since the US didn't consult allies? And again, I don't want to go in a partisan direction with this. I think it's an interesting question though, because it has to do with those second order effects, right? Of making a decision to um, maybe for a short-term gain, uh, for political gain, et cetera, but then thinking about maybe not carefully thinking through the longer-term impacts of what those decisions will, will have, not only on relationships with allies, but potentially also in competition with Russia, with China, et cetera. So um, I'll let anybody take that question. I, I addressed it in, in my opening remarks. Uh, we. We are in a, a, a degraded posture in that space. Uh, and again, this, is, this has nothing to do with, with domestic politics. It's a reality. Uh, our partners, as well as our treaty allies, uh, are taking a, a, a new assessment as to how they partner and why they partner with the United States. It doesn't mean that there's going to be a breach with our treaty allies, per se, but there certainly has been a degradation. Um, I know that from direct contact with uh, former counterparts in capitals that are of NATO states, for example, uh, colleagues who are still in service in, in the interagency have had similar uh, discussions. It's a problem. And if you're an adversary, it is, it is certainly uh, an opportunity uh, to either expand or augment uh, disruptions elsewhere. Uh, but this is certainly a, a, a generational challenge. Uh, it's, it's unique in the sense that uh, people, partners who've been with us shoulder to shoulder have felt like that they were caught short uh, and it will take a long time for us to reestablish credibility with our partners and allies. If I can just like continue on that, Philip. So, so anyone who is monitoring the media like from from China or from Russia or like um, their affiliates, there's like tons of schadenfreude there and also this gloating over like how the West is in decline and the, the Sino-Russian like uh, alliance is the future. I think that it's important, like I think it was like wisely mentioned by Honorable Cooper about that and this is a, of course generational thing, but I think that in a shorter term, I think that we need to present uh, the will and ability to help 
like countries such as Taiwan or or Ukraine in this situation that that for example the US or the, the like wider western alliance is kind of like continuing to have the foothold is continuing to have their backs so just to kind of like show the presence and and show the will and ability also to project if if necessary if i could just add a, add a word about china you know building uh you know, while there's been uh i would call this superficial gloating um it it, it masks or, or it masks a deeper concern because Afghanistan is right next to China. Yes, it shares yes, the border. It shares is very, very uh, maybe about sixty, less than sixty miles uh, total. Uh, but for for China, Afghanistan is the epicenter of of terrorism. Um, it's a significant fault line between South Asia and Central Asia. And while China was very uncomfortable about a U.S. military presence. Um, it secretly hoped that the U.S., you know, they could outsource the problem and the U.S. would solve it. And then maybe eventually they would go home because the U.S. always eventually goes home. Um, but they hope what they're what they're worried is now. Now there's a big mess um, that the U.S. has left behind. And this is not not in China's interests. Hey, hey, Phil, and I'll, I'll just add to this is that, look, um, administrations from both parties have um not consulted with al uh, allies in the past uh, before making decisions, and our allies have engaged in free ridership. So there's there's things that both of us need to do to up our game. But when you make a mistake, you make amends, okay? And there's nothing more dangerous than a learning adversary. And the United States has to show that it's a learning adversary, um, and that what happened, you know, last week or last month doesn't hold going forward. Great, thanks so much for that, Mike, and uh, for the other panelists input as well. Um, I think it's a really good point actually to wrap up on. Um, uh, and thank you all so much for coming and joining us, those of you who are online. Um, again, if you're interested in uh, picking up a copy of the book, it discusses these themes and, and um, largely discusses these themes. Um, you can find it on the event page at um, AEI.com. And um, please feel free still to join in the conversation. We'll continue on social media at hashtag power complacency. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today and have a great day.